Elizabeth Holmes is a pathological liar. Over the course of 20 years, she lied continuously to pursue her goals. These lies led her to great heights, becoming the world's youngest self-made billionaire, and eventually to great lows, a decade in a Texan prison. Holmes set up the infamous blood testing company Theranos. Over the company's 15-year existence, Holmes lied to employees, to investors, to customers, and eventually to investigators. Now Holmes was caught. Theranos no longer exists. Much has been said about this story. Numerous podcasts, TV shows, and books have been made documenting it. But I still have some unanswered questions. After hearing Elizabeth Holmes' story myself, I was left with three questions. I wondered, firstly, why did Elizabeth Holmes decide to lie? Now, obviously, I know she lied to get financial gain, but I wanted to know a bit more. I wanted to know why she continued to lie when it would have made more sense to come clean. I wanted to know why she chose to lie when she could have fixed all of these problems by getting the help she needed and being honest. So that was the first thing. I wanted to know why Elizabeth Holmes decided to continuously lie. The second thing that I wondered was why the staff at Theranos chose to endorse these lies and lie themselves. And finally, I wondered why people believed her lies. I'm not sure those three questions have been answered yet. So I've spent the past few weeks looking into Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes, and her web of lies, while also researching the psychology behind dishonesty. And I've discovered that lying isn't as rare as we like to think. Many of you will be aware of Elizabeth Holmes and the Theranos story. It has been headline news, especially in the tech and business space. TV shows, podcasts, books have documented the subject, and almost all of them will do a better job of telling the Theranos story than I will. But just in case you haven't heard of Theranos or you want to get back up to speed, let me provide a very brief recap. Theranos was founded in 2003 by the Stanford dropout Elizabeth Holmes. She was just 19 at the time and had no prior medical experience, just a handful of months studying chemical engineering. Going against the advice of many of her mentors and teachers, Elizabeth started Theranos and pitched it as a new innovation that could collect vast amounts of data from just a few droplets of blood derived from the tip of a finger. The company's ultimate goal was to democratise healthcare. Rather than the typical blood tests, which require several vials of blood, Theranos claims they could run over 150 tests on just one drop of blood. This, of course, had incredible potential. Blood tests for all sorts of checks, from from oxygen levels and glucose levels to checking for diabetes. All of this now could be done on one tiny device. With Theranos, there would be no need to have blood taken multiple times to run dozens of blood tests. Blood wouldn't have to be sent across the country for testing. It could be done at your local pharmacy, maybe at your home, or even on the battlefield. They claimed that the cost would be much, much cheaper too. In the US, typically, blood tests can cost up to thousands of dollars. With Theranos, the same blood tests would be $100 or less. They also claimed it would save lives. And these, these very big claims, garnered very big investment. By 2013, 10 years after launching, Theranos had $1 billion in investment. The company was valued at $10 billion, and heavyweight politicians like Henry Kissinger sat on their board. During this period, Elizabeth Holmes became famous. She became a recognisable and much adored figure. She was recognised by Forbes. She is the youngest self-made female billionaire on the Forbes 400 list. Her estimated net worth was $4.5 billion. She was honoured at the 2015 Glamour Woman of the Year Awards. I am so incredibly humbled and so honoured to be with this incredible group of women. On CNN. For what it's worth, this Theranos blood test put my cholesterol at 170. My own doctor found it to be 169 just the week before. Holmes says she wants to make this sort of testing available anywhere, anytime. And CBS. A healthcare pioneer is being compared to visionaries like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. This morning, Elizabeth Holmes is part of the new Time 100 list just out. Her mission is to allow blood testing in every drugstore at a fraction of Medicare costs. 
Her innovation has fueled anticipation in the healthcare industry and made Holmes the world's youngest female self-made billionaire. But all of this recognition was based on lies. Numerous lies that were shared not just by Elizabeth Holmes, but by a whole host of investors, employees, and even journalists. Throughout the company's 15-year existence, they never once produced a product that achieved any of Elizabeth's claims. No machine developed by Theranos democratised healthcare in a way that was promised. And these lies, they weren't one-offs. It wasn't one lie that grew out of proportion, or a small number of white lies alongside a lot of reliable truths. No, the entire company was built on lies. To get Elizabeth's initial investment and to secure her multi-million dollar deal with Walgreens, Holmes claimed that the Theranos product had been used extensively by the military. It never had. Walgreens were repeatedly told the product worked and that tests were done on a single drop of blood. None of that was true. In 2014, Holmes claimed that the company had a revenue of $100 million in the previous year. The actual revenue was $100,000. And even when news about Theranos' lies and Elizabeth's dishonesty started to break in 2016, she continued to lie, doubling down rather than telling the truth. This is what happens when you work to change things. First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Now many of you will have heard this story up to now. You know that Elizabeth Holmes lied repeatedly. But I'm still left wondering something that I don't have answers to. Why? Did she lie? What made this smart, hard-working Stanford student who had bags of talent, according to her teachers, decide to lie? Well, look, we will never truly know. I don't have Elizabeth Holmes with me today to ask her. But there has been a lot of research into honesty and dishonesty. And there are a number of studies which actually help to uncover why people like Elizabeth choose to lie. For example, there's something that happened in her upbringing that I think made her more inclined to twist the truth. On the podcast series, Dropout, which is fantastic and was easily the main source I've used for this show, the journalists interview an old family friend, someone who was close to Elizabeth as a child. The friend recalls speaking to Elizabeth when she was a child and asking her what she wanted to be when she was older. Without skipping a beat, Elizabeth responded that she wanted to be a billionaire. The friend remembered being a little taken back by this. This was an odd thing for a child to say. She didn't want to be an astronaut or a doctor or a princess. She wanted to be a billionaire. The friend sort of pushed Elizabeth, saying, well, you might want to be a talented musician, or perhaps you'd want to be president instead. But no, Elizabeth was steadfast. She only wanted to be a billionaire. So where did this come from? How does a kid become obsessed with this singular goal? Well, I think it comes from her family. See, Elizabeth's great-great-great-grandfather founded the Filchman Yeast Company. The company was extraordinarily successful, propelling the family to one of the richest in America. But the company didn't stay at the top for long. They didn't capitalise on their opportunity, and sales eventually fell. Her parents experienced the taste of great wealth, a fleeting feeling of the extraordinary power wealth provides. This, as the literature on psychology shows, will have a profound effect on someone. The behavioural science principle known as loss aversion reveals that the human brain experiences losses as more painful than equivalent gains. Losing $10, for example, feels twice as bad as gaining $10 feels good. Now imagine how hard it would be for a family to lose billions of dollars. Just imagine how happy you would feel if you won a billion pounds, while losing that amount will feel twice as bad as that feels good. It's clearly something that's quite painful for people to go through, and it's clear that this pain had a great impact on Elizabeth. Elizabeth channeled that pain at a young age and longed to regain that wealth. That might be one reason why she lied. She lied because she was so desperate to regain that wealth. I don't think that's enough on its own, but it might be one reason. Another potential reason is ego motivation. Now, Dan Ariely, in his book about dishonesty, describes ego motivation quite neatly. He says our honesty is driven by two competing forces. On the one hand, we want to view ourselves as honest, honourable people. We want to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and feel good about what we see. This is what psychologists call ego motivation. We are motivated to look at ourselves in the mirror and feel good about what we see. On the other hand, 
We also want to benefit from potential gains where they are possible. And for example, financial gains is a great example. That's standard financial motivation. And studies show that all of us will cheat if it leads to gains, as long as it doesn't spoil our self-image or our ego motivation. So we will cheat as long as it doesn't break this view that we have of ourselves, that we are honest people. Now, this surprised me. Research shows that most people will cheat if given the chance the vast majority will lie. It did surprise me, but there is lots of evidence to back it up. Dan Ariely, Nina Mazar and On Amir ran tests to prove it. In their experiments, participants were given a matrix-based calculation task and were offered financial rewards for the amount of correct answers that they got. In the control condition, participants simply handed their answers to the researcher at the end and were paid for all of the answers they got right. Nobody cheated in this group because really there was no option to cheat. However, there was a second condition. This is called the shredder condition and it introduced a chance to let people cheat. Here, after the participants had finished answering their questions, they were told to shred their answer sheet and then tell the researchers how many answers they got correct. So the researcher wouldn't actually know how many they got correct. They would rely on the participant being honest. The results showed that the majority of participants cheated to some extent in the shredder condition. It showed that on average, people said that they answered two more questions correctly than they would have in the control condition. The study suggests that people are more likely to cheat when they have the opportunity to destroy the evidence of their cheating and convince themselves and convince others that they are honest people. Just to be clear, these participants didn't take both tests. They didn't take the shredding test and then the normal test. That wouldn't work. Instead, they ran the tests hundreds of times to get a clear average on how many questions are typically answered correctly. And then in the shredder condition, they found that the average was considerably higher, showing that most people cheated a little bit. So all of us cheat a little bit. This surprised me. And in April 2011, it also surprised Dan Weiss, a college student who worked at the JFK Centre for the Performing Arts. In the centre, there was a gift shop that was run by volunteers. Volunteers, typically, are wholesome, trustworthy people. But $150,000 in cash went missing from the gift shop every single year. Dan suspected that a single employee was taking the cash on their own. So he set up a sting operation with a detective to catch the employee. And the two of them found the thief very quickly. Immediately, they saw an employee steal from the machine as they were closing up. They tracked the employee down, eventually caught them red-handed with $60 of stolen bills. The employee was fired, case closed, but not quite. The theft continued. In fact, there was no noticeable drop in the amount of cash being stolen. Clearly it wasn't just one individual. Eventually, Dan discovered that nobody was taking a lot of money, nobody was stealing a lot, but everyone was taking a little bit here and there. Every volunteer stole a little bit. Dan then implemented an inventory system where where volunteers had to record the cash levels at the end of the day and the fevery stopped. He summarised the moral of the story nicely on his interview with This American Life. He said, We are all going to take things from each other if we have the chance. Many people need controls around them for them to do the right thing. Now, this doesn't even begin to explain why Elizabeth Holmes lied to the extent she did, but maybe it explains some of Holmes' initial lies. Holmes was slightly dishonest about how much experience she had when getting her initial investment. She claimed she had a prototype that worked a little bit better than she had suggested. These small white lies, they feel okay because she retained her view that she was doing the honourable thing. A small white lie might feel worth it, especially if she eventually goes on to get the investment that does actually help her change the future of healthcare, that does actually help her save people's lives. Now, I don't endorse this, but almost all of us do it. We all make up white lies to justify our decisions. Take students who are late with their coursework. Rather than just be honest about their laziness and say, look, I haven't done it on time, most students come up with a lie that makes them justify their tardiness. Like, for example, a sick grandparent. After collecting data over several years, Mike Adams, a professor of biology at Eastern Connecticut State University, has shown that grandmothers are 10 times more likely to die before a midterm exam 
and 19 times more likely to die before a final exam than any other time during the year. Obviously, that's not true, but that's what the students were telling the professor. But these initial lies from Holmes, they don't explain why she continued to lie. After 15 years, why was she still extensively lying about her product, her revenue, and her customers? Well, research into dishonesty does suggest a bit of an answer. There's something called the the what-the-hell effect. Now, studies into dishonesty have shown that once somebody has cheated once and gotten away with it, they'll start to cheat even more. In the experiments, there was a very sharp transition when at some point the participants suddenly graduated from engaging in a little bit of cheating to cheating in every single opportunity they had. And this general pattern of behaviour became known as the the what-the-hell effect. Once participants realised they could get away with cheating without any chance of being caught, the amount of lies grew significantly. Researchers cited in The Honest Truth About Dishonesty linked this behaviour with dieting. Once we cheat once on a diet, we are far more likely to abandon the diet and succumb to the temptation to cheat. Elizabeth Holmes developed this cheating habit, seeing that her lies worked, that they landed, that they got her the investment she needed. She was tempted to repeat the trick. But this left me wondering, how did she sleep at night? How did she live with herself after all this systematic pathological lying? Well, again, some of the research suggests an answer. See, when we're lying, when we cheat, we also lie to ourselves. One research experiment, again cited in Ariely's book, involved participants taking a similar math quiz, but with some of the answers being shown while they were working. The study was set up in a way so the participants believed they could cheat without anyone noticing. Basically, the sheet that they were given to write their answers had the actual correct answers rubbed out, but the participants could see where it was rubbed out, so they could basically cheat by realising, oh, okay, I just need to put my answer in there. As we know from the studies I shared earlier, in this scenario, the majority of people chose to cheat. That's what we do. Most of us cheat when we think we can get away with it. But what happens next is very interesting. In the second phase of the study, these students who cheated were asked to predict how well they would do on a similar quiz. They were asked if they would get the same amount of questions right as they did before. This time, They knew they wouldn't be able to cheat. They knew they wouldn't be able to see the answers. They didn't have the same benefit that they had last time. And yet, the results showed that the participants who cheated in the first phase quickly convinced themselves that they had earned that score, leading them to be overconfident in their guesses about their ability in the second phase of the test. They said they'd answer the same amount of questions correctly in the second phase. They said they might even answer even more, even though they knew they had only got that score through cheating. These students honestly thought that they were smarter due to their high score. They lied to themselves, telling themselves that their score was due to their intelligence, not due to their cheating. We lie to ourselves. We rationalise our lies. And the more praise we get for our lies, the more likely we are to continue lying. Dan Ariely conducted a study to test the effects of positive public recognition on participants' likelihood to cheat. He gave participants a similar math test as before. He loves those math tests. And like before, this time they had the answers available and it allowed them to cheat. Afterwards, some participants were given a certificate with their name and score printed on official looking paper, a really nice bit of public recognition, while other participants in a different group were given no certificate. Those who received the certificate predicted that they would perform even better on the second test than those who didn't receive the certificate, even when the two had got the same score. This suggested that getting public praise, for lying in this case, increased their confidence and made them believe that their lies, that their score, reflected their true ability. And after getting that praise, they were far more likely to continue cheating in further tests. Elizabeth's continuous praise from all sorts of public figures like Bill Clinton, Henry Kissinger, and even Joe Biden only made it easier for her to lie. This public praise makes lying more alluring. And Holmes hasn't wasted any time. Last week, she became the youngest member ever named to the prestigious Horatio Alger Association, which recognizes grit and drive. You were the only woman up there with a lot of older white men. This is true. Yeah, it was. <laughs> All of this being so, it's important to make the point that the level of Elizabeth's lying greatly outweighs how much a normal person 
would lie. It is fortunately extremely rare for someone to lie to the extent that Elizabeth Holmes lied. That level of dishonesty is rarely seen. And yet, it is alarming for me how all of us lie a little bit. We lie even more when we feel we can get away with it. We make bigger and bigger lies when we feel it's necessary. And when we receive public recognition for our lies, we double down and we lie even more. I highly doubt that any of you listening would continue to lie like Elizabeth Holmes did. But if put in her shoes, I strongly predict that all of us would lie a bit. The studies seem pretty conclusive about this. Lying is unfortunately far more commonplace than we would hope. But I'm only just scratching the surface of the reasons why Holmes is deciding to lie. There is something else which is happening to her, which I believe tipped her over the edge. Elizabeth Holmes was a a systematic liar who showed little remorse for the devastating impact her lies had on other people's finances, their mental health, and of course, in some cases, their physical health. I hoped, when researching the psychology behind dishonesty, that I'd find plenty of studies showing how lying was rare and how most of us stay honest. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. Few of us follow in Elizabeth's footsteps, but plenty of us lie, especially if we're tired or working on something difficult. Another of Dan Ariely's brilliant studies showed just this. He recruited hundreds of participants and split them into two groups. The first group was asked to write an essay on what they'd done in the previous day, but they weren't allowed to use the letters X and Z. Now, this is fairly easy. Most of us can write as normal without using those letters. The second group had it much, much harder. They were tasked to write their essays without using the letters A and N. Now, doing this is really difficult. It requires a lot of thinking, and if you were to do this, it would quickly deplete your energy. Now, after the students had to write these essays, Dan Ariely got both groups to take the matrix calculation task, the same task I've referred to a few times, you know, the one where you have to answer some calculation-based questions. In the test, he gave both groups the chance to cheat by shredding the results and lying about their results to the researcher. Those who wrote essays without using the letters X and Z and later shredded their answers, indulged in a little bit of cheating. They claimed to solve around one extra question on average. But the participants who had undergone the ordeal of writing essays without using letters A and N, well, they claimed to have solved three extra questions. As it turns out, the more taxing and depleting a task is, the more a participant will cheat. What do these findings suggest? Well, generally speaking, if you're wear down, your willpower will decrease. You will have considerably more trouble regulating your desires, leading you towards lies. Elizabeth Holmes, like many other leaders, I should add, regularly spoke about working extreme hours, seven days a week, first thing in the morning to last thing at night. She had no children, no close friends, and nothing really to take her away from her job. Her romantic partner at the time was the company's president, Sonny Belwani. In other words, Holmes was almost certainly like those in the depleted group, running on fumes and far more likely to cheat. Ariely did an extended version of the test to show that being depleted can lead to really extreme levels of cheating. When the depleted participants had the option to cheat twice by shredding their answers and also by seeing the answers to the questions in the faint outline on the sheet, they descended into even greater levels of dishonesty. When the option was there to cheat twice, the depleted group who had written the essay without using the letters A and N, well, they cheated 197% more than those who weren't depleted. Two times more just if you're knackered or if your willpower is low. Again, I want to make it clear that none of this can excuse Elizabeth Holmes. She could and should have taken a break. But understanding how the brain operates in these depleted scenarios, I think explains why she was able to lie so much and also how she was able to openly lie to her employees. The employees recall her lying about being away from the headquarters, away from the office, saying she was at home when they could actually see her in her own office replying to the email. That's a weird level of lying, which only starts to make sense if you consider how depleted she may have been. Walgreen employees remember her pitching to them with a fake picture of the Theranos logo on a flag in Afghanistan. 
Now, this picture didn't look fake at the time, it looked real, but knowing what we know about Theranos now, it was never used in Afghanistan, so we know that this was a blatant lie. We know that Elizabeth or one of her team must have doctored this image. These lies, I find them kind of astonishing. It's incredible that someone would go to that extent, but they maybe make a little more sense when you consider the research I've shared. There's more to these studies as well. They explain a lot more about people's behaviour and dishonesty. For example, when we have a chance to financially gain from a lie, we are far more likely to endorse that lie. A study by professors Dalen Kane, George Lowenstein and Don Moore involved participants playing either the role of an estimator or advisor in a game where they had to guess the amount of money in a jar. So, You can imagine it, there's a big jar of money in the room. Some people are told to estimate how much is in the jar. The others advise the estimator. They try and give the estimator advice on how they should guess. The advisors were given an informational advantage and were paid based on the accuracy of the estimator's guesses. They're working as a team here. They both want to get as close as possible. So the informational advantage, what was that? Well, advisors might be told, for example, that there is less than $20 in the jar. And the advisor would then pass that on to the estimator to help the estimator make an accurate guess. Now, that was the control part of the study, but there was a really interesting conflict of interest condition, a slight variant which changed the game. Here, advisors were paid more if estimators guessed over the value, if they guessed more money than there actually was in the jar. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest here. The advisors want the estimators to guess a little more than perhaps they should. And as a result, having this conflict of interest made the advisors in this condition, on average, suggest estimates that were consistently 25% higher than they were in the control condition. In other words, the advisors were clearly influenced by the conflict of interest. They exaggerated their advice, they lied to some extent, for their own financial gain. The research helps answer another question I had about Theranos, which was, why did none of the stakeholders call this out? See, other than one or two very critical stakeholders, most, including almost all of the board, reportedly wholeheartedly believed the lies and even publicly shared them themselves. This confused me. Sure, Elizabeth might be a pathological liar, but every member of the board too? That really seemed unlikely, but that was until I had seen this research. Everybody at Theranos had a conflict of interest. They benefited if Theranos did well. And just like the advisors in the research, they were far more likely to publicly endorse and share these lies and ignore their doubts because they could financially gain from doing so. Which links to another question I had, which was why didn't employees question these lies? Now, I should say, many employees did question these lies, eventually outing Elizabeth. Actually, it was a whistleblower internally, which really showcased how Theranos was lying. That said, Theranos existed for 15 years. It raised one billion in funding and employed thousands of people over this period. Why did it take 10 years for these lies to start coming out? Were the staff at Theranos also liars? Well, no. See, a lot of the rhetoric about Theranos is that there was a culture of dishonesty. This word culture. It's thrown around a lot, but for Theranos, this culture of dishonesty was very real. It was very literal. Study after study show that seeing other people cheating can dramatically increase how likely you are to cheat. And in an organisation where the head of the organisation is cheating and board members are backing her up and other people are lying, you too will lie as well. In another version of Dan Ariely's Matrix test, where participants could lie again by shredding their results, There was a slight twist. In this version, Dan added a social element to the task. If you were in this version of the test, you would be seated at your desk. The experimenter would give you the sheet, tell you the instructions, and say, you may begin. You would dive straight into the first problem, trying to solve it as as quickly as you could to maximize your earnings. And then, in this condition, after about 60 seconds, while you were still on the first question, you'd hear someone else, a blonde, skinny guy, stand up and say, I'm finished. What should I do now? (laughs) You'd be sitting there thinking, impossible. I haven't even solved the first matrix. How has he completed all of them? You and everyone else would stare at him in disbelief. Obviously, he's cheated. Nobody could have completed all 20 matrixes in less than 60 seconds. But then the instructor tells him, okay, go and shred your worksheet. The guy walks to the back of the room. He shreds his worksheet and then says, oh, by the way, I solved everything. So I'll get the full payment, right? The test coordinator says, yes. And then this liar heads off with all the available prize money. 
Having observed this episode, how would you react? Do you become outraged that the guy has clearly cheated and got away with it? Do you stand up and say something? Do you call him out for obvious cheating? Or do you perhaps start cheating yourself? Unfortunately, the latter is what actually happens. In this version of Ariely's study, cheating increases dramatically. In this version, participants ended up claiming to solve an average of 15 out of 20 of the questions. That's an additional 8 questions right beyond the control condition, an additional 3 questions right beyond the shredder condition. Nobody called the blonde cheater out, and everybody ended up lying more. I think this study really helps us understand what it would have been like to work at Veranos. Whistleblowers, those who stand up against cheating, are unfortunately rare. It's not a surprise that the vast majority at Theranos said nothing. And it's also not a surprise that they went along with the lies, lying to themselves and endorsing this dishonesty. Study after study reveals that when we see someone else obviously lying, just like Elizabeth Holmes was, we are far more likely to do so ourselves. It's clear that this culture of dishonesty at Theranos made employees far more likely to cheat. And I'm not passing the blame here. Elizabeth Holmes is at fault for this. It was her dishonesty that inspired others and her actions that stopped honest discussion in the organisation. For example, she went to great lengths to keep external stakeholders out of the business. Journalists, customers, even investors were rarely allowed to independently visit Theranos and, and look around the lab. Even regulators from the US government were restricted in their access. Holmes kept departments within Theranos from talking to one another. The science and engineering teams were kept separate and unable to talk to the marketing and sales team. The two weren't allowed to talk, they weren't allowed to collaborate. Which is, of course, a shame, because when we see people who aren't part of our group, who aren't in our team, for example, or who are from a different company, for example, when we see them lying, we're far more likely to call it out. In a replication of the previous study I shared, Dan Ariely made a slight tweak. This time, the blonde actor, who claimed to get all the answers right, wore a different outfit. He wore a University of Pittsburgh sweatshirt, which signalled that he was an outsider in the group, because everybody else in the group was from Carnegie University. There was a strong rivalry between these schools, so the Carnegie students wouldn't consider him part of their group. And the results showed that in this condition, students did still cheat a bit, but significantly less than when they assumed the actor was part of their own social group. It suggests that group identity plays a role in the contagion of cheating behaviour. And it suggests that employees would have been far less likely to cheat if they'd been able to collaborate and see people from other departments, other teams lying, or if independent stakeholders were regularly let into the business. Now, after listening to all of this, you might start to wonder if the lies at Theranos were perhaps expected. Study after study shows that most people lie, most people cheat. What's the difference between these students and these tests and the lies Elizabeth shared? Isn't that expected? Won't the severity and the size of the lie scale with the potential gains? Well, no. No, I don't think so. I don't believe Elizabeth Holmes is a normal person in extraordinary circumstances. I think she is a pathological liar. There is too much evidence of lying throughout her career to question that. And pathological liars, they are different from the rest of us. In fact, they literally have different brains. A team of researchers, led by Ye Ling Lang, conducted a study on pathological liars to identify what characteristics distinguish them. In the study, they got 108 job seekers from a temporary employment agency. And these job seekers, they were asked a bunch of psychological tests and, and given interviews. The researchers found out of these 108 people, 12 pathological liars. So 12 people who consistently lied. They lied about their experience, they lied about their skills, and the researchers cross-referenced their lies with what their family said and what their friends said, and were able to prove that these people were clearly lying. They took these 12 pathological liars, and then they put them into a brain scanner to explore their brain structure, and they compared it to see if there was anything different about the brains of these pathological liars. And the study found that the pathological liars had 14% less grey matter and 22 to 26% more white matter in the prefrontal cortex. This was basically increased connectivity in their brains, and the researchers hypothesised that it helped them make more connections between different memories and ideas, which might be the reason why they are natural liars. It suggests that higher brain connectivity could make it easier for all of us or any of us to lie, rationalise our lies and become more dishonest. I think it's obvious that Elizabeth falls into this group, this this group of 10% pathological liars. 
But what is scary for me is how many people in the study were pathological liars. The researchers, as I said, conducted 108 interviews and found 12 people who were consistently lying. They were lying about their work, lying about their school, lying about the crimes they committed and their family background. 12 out of 108 is almost 10%. That is surprisingly high. The number of people who systematically lie doesn't appear to be based on a few bad apples. It is much more commonplace, with hundreds of potential pathological liars at your typical thousand-person business. Look, Elizabeth Holmes is a pathological liar and is obviously guilty of her crimes. But perhaps she's not as rare as we might like to think. Lying is unfortunately commonplace. All of us lie when given the chance, and a surprisingly large minority of people are pathological liars. While Theranos was a a once-in-a-decade example of fraud, lying is a a once-a-second occurrence that happens across businesses every single day. It's depressingly common. But everything I've shared today hasn't actually answered all of the questions I had about Theranos. Sure, we know why Elizabeth lied, we know why her investors lied, and we know why her employees lied as well. But we don't know why people believed her. So, on the next episode of Nudge, I will dig deeper into the psychological tricks that Elizabeth Holmes used to convince and manipulate people. I will explain the tactics she used to persuade and how she fooled the world. To make sure you don't miss that episode, and to get the first notification about it, sign up to my newsletter. Head to nudgepodcast.com, click newsletter in the menu, and if you sign up, you'll get an email as soon as the second episode goes live. Now, I really hope you've enjoyed today's show. If you did, please do go and check out Dan Ariely's book, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. It is a cracking book that details why we lie, but also suggests solutions that you and your business can use to prevent lying so you don't end up in a scenario even close to Theranos's. I'm Phil Agnew. I'm the host of Nudge. If you've liked this episode and you want to let me know what you think, you can send me a message on social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm at p underscore agnew on there p underscore agnew and i'm on linkedin as well and phil agnew on there so reach out let me know what you think thank you so much for listening folks please do make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to make sure you get next monday's episode which will be part two on elizabeth holmes the pathological liar